We shall move to questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? I give the call to the honourable member for Wannan. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration. Was the minister the decision maker in issuing a visa to Khaled Beydoun, or was the minister or his office made aware that Beydoun had applied for a visa? Give the call to the Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, that visa would have gone through the department. It was not brought to my attention before it was issued. Give the call to the honourable member for Werriwa. Here. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister? <laughs> Order. The member for Werriwa has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister please update the House on efforts to bring Australians home from Lebanon? The call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much. I thank the member for Wera for her question. I know that this is an issue that uh, she has raised uh, directly with myself and the Minister for Home Affairs, as she has a, a sizeable population uh, of Lebanese origin, many of whom would, like many of our electorates, have been. Uh, in Lebanon during what is this extraordinarily difficult time. Uh, I can report that as of the 8th of October, a total of 1,215 Australians, permanent residents and their immediate family members have been assisted by the government to depart Lebanon. This includes six Australian government flights, two on Saturday the 5th of October, carrying 407 passengers, two on the 6th carrying 448 passengers and two on the 7th carrying 311 passengers. There are 3,892 Australians and their immediate family members registered to depart. Vulnerable and displaced people are being prioritised and we know that hundreds of thousands of people in Lebanon have been displaced. The scenes of families reuniting at Australian airports has been so moving and I was pleased that the member for Watson, the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, was able to greet uh, many of the Australian citizens that when they arrived uh, here in Sydney uh, just uh, last night. Uh, one returning Australian, Aurora Garib, told the media she was very proud to be a citizen. To quote her, the things the Australian government did for us nobody in the world would do, she said. Our message to Australians in Lebanon remains to please take the first flight option that is available to you. There should not be an empty seat on any of these flights. Uh, we will not be able to continue these flights indefinitely. Can I say that Australians in Lebanon who wish to leave should ensure they are registered via DFAT's crisis portal or by calling the Australian government's 24-hour consular emergency centre on plus six one two six two six one double three zero five. Further flights back to Australia are planned for coming days. Two more flights are scheduled to leave Beirut uh, today, uh, Beirut time. Australians and their family are staying in temporary accommodation in Larnaca in Cyprus and returning to Australia on connecting flights. Can I thank uh, Foreign Minister Wong for her tireless efforts. Can I thank DFAT, the Australian Defence Force and other Australian officials who have been working around the clock to get these Australians home. I thank all the members of the National Security Committee who have been meeting uh, regularly uh, to, uh, to put these measures in place in advance. And I do want to thank the airlines as well who are assisting with these repatriation flights, uh, Qantas and Qatar providing their aircraft and personnel to assist with the safe return of Australians from what is a very dangerous and precarious position. But once again, to reiterate, please come home when you have the opportunity. Do not wait. Do not think things might get better. Please come home and be safe. On indulgence, the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I want to uh, agree and uh, wholeheartedly support the comments of the Prime Minister and to all Australians, uh, Australian citizens who are in Lebanon at the moment, please heed the advice of the Prime Minister the Australian Government. Uh, please listen to family and loved ones back here where they are urging you to return back to Australia. 
It is a precarious time in the Middle East, as we well know, and the Australian government uh, has done a good job in providing uh, clear advice to Australian citizens uh, who are in the region <coughs> to take up the offer of the flights, and people should do that uh, without hesitation. And again, I endorse uh, and support the words of the Prime Minister in providing uh, that encouragement to Australian citizens. Yeah. Call to the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister agree that the Australian Greens have been racist and anti-Semitic in the position that they've adopted since October 7, 2023? There is some difficulties with that question as it's asking for a, an opinion or a, a view, and, and those questions have not been permitted in the, within the standing order. So perhaps to assist the Chamber and to assist the Leader of the Opposition, if he could make the question relevant perhaps to the direct responsibilities of the Prime Minister or what he's in charge of. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to previous statements of the Prime Minister where he's been critical of the Greens political party and their stance which has been racist and anti-Semitic that has been adopted since October 7, 2023. Does the Prime Minister still have that view? Order. We'll deal, we'll, we will, we, look, the Leader of the Opposition will deal with this. We'll find a way through. People are entitled to ask questions. It's my job to assist all members to ensure that there is a free flow of debate. Leader of the House. Well, it's a broad question, and it's referring to the Prime Minister's former statement, so it's within order. I'll give the call to the Prime Minister, but it will be obviously a very broad answer. Thank, thanks, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question, and I reiterate this point, that there have been uh, moments of anti-Semitism and racism in some of the responses that we've seen. Uh, in the political debate uh, taking place uh, here in Australia. I have been critical of the stance that the Greens political party have made, but I make this point as well, that many people in the Greens political party, like in other parties, the Liberal Party, the National Party, as well as the Labor Party and Independents, are people of goodwill who join political parties uh, because they think that is a vehicle for them to make the change that they want. Um, it's not something that I agree with. Uh, I would always be a member of a political party that's a party of government rather than a party of protest. Uh, but I wouldn't want uh, to suggest that uh, every member uh, in my electorate or in other places as well uh, has engaged in that. Uh, in the lead up to the local government elections in the Inner West Council in my local area, uh, I was extraordinarily uh, critical of the actions of uh, Greens councillors and their supporters in being a part of a campaign, including uh, a counterproductive campaign outside my electorate office, but also in council meetings, where a council meeting had to be abandoned uh, because of the disruption that had occurred. Now, the Inner West Council has a lot of things to do. It looks after rubbish, it looks after roads, it looks after housing, it looks after the local community. It is not a player in the conflict in the Middle East. And one of the things that I've been critical of is uh, the attempt to argue that uh, Australia can have uh, not a major role compared with a country like the United States in what occurs in the Middle East, but we can make a decision that we won't bring conflict here. We do have a role in that. And I'd say that people, if they are holding uh, office in federal or state parliament or in local government, uh, need to, whatever political party they represent. Bear in mind the words of Mike Burgess as well, the ASIO Director General, about the responsibility that we have to take the heat down the temperature down in this country rather than to lift it up. And whichever political party is engaged in that, I would urge for everyone in this chamber and indeed everyone who holds a, a role in public life to bear that, uh, that warning and caution of uh, Director General Burgess in mind. Give a call to the honourable member for Fraser. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. 
How is the Albanese Labor government making it easier for working Australians in my electorate and across the country to own a home? What might prevent that from happening? The call to the order. There will be no interjections before I call the minister. Give the call to the minister for housing and homelessness. Thanks so much, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Fraser for his question. The member for Fraser and I share a pretty simple belief. We want to live in a country where ordinary Australians can get the opportunity to own their own home. But he knows, and I know, that too many of our constituents spend their weekends in rental queues, dozens of people deep, looking at homes that they don't even really want to live in. We've got a generation of low- and middle-income people who are stuck in rent traps, who feel anger and despair at the notion that home ownership feels out of reach. And all of us in this chamber have got constituents who are making major life decisions, delaying children, spending two hours in the car every day getting to and from work because they can't find the housing that they need. It's not good enough. And that is why our government is so committed to making a difference to this problem. And right now, Speaker, the parliament has the chance to do just that. Our help to buy legislation will back 40,000 childcare workers, teachers and apprentices into home ownership where they otherwise have no chance of getting into the housing market. There is Order. genuinely no sound policy reason not to support this bill, but that's never stopped the Noalition, the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens, who are today standing in the path of this reform. Order. Order. The minister will pause. The I'd like to hear from the manager of opposition business. Term out of order and the minister should be asked to withdraw. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, just to the point of order, the earlier ruling that you'd made was based on parties being used by their correct titles and therefore you had objected to that term being used when it was a combination of the Liberal Party and the National Party. It's another thing altogether to use that term where there's no protection under the standing orders where a new alliance is formed between the Greens, the Liberal Party and the National Party. Order. The the Leader of the House just needs to state his point of order without excess details. Look, everyone, the Minister, whoever the Minister is interjecting can cease immediately as well. Just to assist the House, I'm just going to allow, uh, enable the Minister not to use that term and just to refer back to the question without any titles. If she was referring to political parties to assist the House, I'd ask her to assist me in addressing political parties by their correct titles. I'm absolutely happy to do that, Speaker, and I would encourage those opposite, if they don't want to be called that, to stop teaming up with those on the crossbench yeah. to stand in the path of critical things that will help us address the housing issues in the minds of Australians. Now, Speaker, in some senses I expect this ridiculous bloody-mindedness on this policy that we see from those opposite, because it was a decade of inaction on the part of their party, which has in part brought us to where we are today on housing. But I do expect better of the Australian Greens Party, Speaker. Now, the hypocrisy from the Greens is so outrageous, Speaker, that they actually bought a shared equity scheme, a similar policy, to the election in 2022. They're actually coming into the parliament and voting against their own policy. And they're holding to ransom the housing aspiration of 40,000 people who need and deserve the help of government. Now, Speaker, our party takes a very different view. Those 40,000 people those childcare workers, the early career nurses, the aged care workers, those people are the reason that my colleagues and I get out of bed every morning. Yeah. Those people are the reason that the member for Fraser and I decided to go into politics. And I'd remind the parliament, this is not some abstract political debate here. The things we do in this member chamber have real consequences for real people. 40,000 people can have their lives changed by this law, but those opposite and those on the crossbench stand in the path of progress. Now, I'd say to the Greens, they're good at making a very big noise about their concerns about housing progress, but when it, when it comes time to make a difference, they will choose politics every single time, and they deserve every day to be condemned for that stance. Before I call the next question, I'm just going to do a few acknowledgements into the gallery. I'm pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today is a delegation of United States congressional staff visiting Parliament House hosted by the Department of, Parliament of Foreign Affairs and Trade 
and I am also pleased to inform the House that President of Gallery today is a delegation of representatives and partners from Settlement Services International. They are in Canberra to launch their active Australia Skills campaign aimed at reducing barriers faced by overseas trained Australians and also to welcome back to Parliament Mrs K Elizabeth Hull AO, former member for Riverina. Welcome to you all to question time. Order. Give the call to the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Speaker. To the Prime Minister. In the gallery today, we have several people who have tried to meet with you and your ministers to tell you how gambling addiction has ruined their lives. They say that gambling ads constantly trigger them to gamble, and they're asking you to ban all gambling ads to stop the normalisation of gambling, especially for children. Prime Minister, why have you engaged directly with those who profit from gambling, but not with these people? And what do you have to say to them as they sit here today? The call to the Prime Minister. Well, I was with the member for Goldstein last night, and so she's fully aware of where I've been and fully aware I've been with today. So I reject the assertion uh, that uh, I won't meet with people. The last person I met with on this issue was Tim Costello uh, ten days ago. Give the call to the honourable member for Reid. My question is to the Prime Minister. What is the Albanese Labor government's plan to help more Australians into home ownership and what is standing in the way? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Order. The Minister for Housing will cease interjecting and cease using that term. Order. I thank, uh, I thank the member for her question. And uh, my neighbour in Reed is fully aware of the pressures that are on in housing in our, our shared uh, community of the inner west of Sydney, which is why Labor's Help to Buy program, aimed at helping 40,000 Australians buy a home of their own, is such a practical initi initiative. Uh, we're stepping up to make Austra Australians to get them uh, the assistance they need to buy a home. It's a pretty simple scheme, and it's one that's worked around the world. It's worked in the UK, it's worked in New Zealand, it's worked uh, in WA for decades. And that's why uh, the clue is in the title, Help to Buy. Uh, the Liberals, of course, never want to help, and the Greens don't want people to buy. <laughs> They're against home ownership. So perhaps it's uh, understanding of why uh, this has occurred. But Australia's housing crisis, of course, didn't happen overnight. Order. The former government didn't Members bother to have a housing minister the entire time uh, that they were in office. They just didn't, didn't bother. And their solution today is much the same. Stand in the way, Member block help, playing politics instead of progress. And, of course, uh, the Greens political party have blocked more homes than they've ever built. Uh, there's, there's a plan... At the moment, in my electorate, uh, for housing at Taverners Hill along Parramatta Road, there, there's a plan uh, for the old Balmain Leagues Club that's been derelict for decades, just there wasting away. There's a plan for housing there, uh, but those opposite think there's too many houses being built there. It's on Victoria Road. And the local state member for the Greens political party is worried about overshadowing <laughs> onto Victoria Road. So as the drivers drive along that main thoroughfare, they might get a bit of shadow <laughs> where, where they go. Well, we on this side, of course, support more homes. And that's why we're getting on with the job of building them. Now, this isn't the be-all and end-all. Uh, we have uh, record funding for social and, and uh, public housing. Uh, we have our program as well. We're trying to get going for build to rent. So we want every aspect. We want more public housing. We want more private rental housing, and we want more home ownership. All three. And we want to provide assistance to states and territories as well for planning to make sure that local and state government are approving more housing. Uh, we know this issue is too important to wait, and it's beyond my comprehension how those in the Senate continue to block. Call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
Will the Prime Minister take a principled stance and rule out giving preferences to the racist and anti-Semitic Greens political party at the next election? Order. Order. Members on my right. The, pri the Prime Minister. The Minister for Housing and Homelessness is now warned. No one is to interject before a Prime Minister or Minister is to speak. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Well, when I came uh, into this House in 1996, there was a fairly famous redhead was elected and used to sit up in that back corner. Because at that time, uh, Pauline Hanson uh, was uh, disendorsed by the Liberal Party. Disendorsed. I don't know what the voting record is there in the Senate there, <laughs> but I, I'm yet to, as much as we talk about legislation, we put her automatically in the column of the LNP, uh, an LNP that has said uh, very clearly, in the election that's underway at the moment in Queensland, the LNP are saying very clearly that they'll give preferences to the LNP, give preferences to, to One Nation. To one nation. That is what they are saying. And if, and, if and, if, and, and if they're if they worried about preferences to the Greens and the Greens being elected to Parliament, the only reason why there are Greens in the Queensland Parliament, the only reason is because the Queensland LNP put them there with their preferences. Order. Give the call to the honourable member for Corwell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What progress has the Albanese Labor government made in fighting inflation and easing the cost of living? What obstacles are standing in the way? Give the call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the wonderful member for Corwell for her question. There is a very good reason why questions on inflation are coming from this side of the House and not on that from that side of the House, Mr Speaker, and that's because we got some new numbers between the last time Parliament sat and Parliament sitting today. And what those numbers show is that headline inflation has fallen substantially uh, from three and a half percent to two point seven percent in monthly terms. That is less than half what we inherited from those opposite, and it's less than a third of its peak in the year that we were elected. Now, our cost of living help is a really important part of this story, but it's not the only part of the story. Trimmed mean inflation also went down from 3.8 to 3.4. The measure that excludes volatile items went down from 3.7 to 3. Non-tradable went down from 4.5 to 3.8. Services inflation went down as well. And what all this means, Mr Speaker, is that we are making welcome and encouraging progress in the fight against inflation. Headline inflation was down, underlying inflation was down, and domestic homegrown inflation was down as well, Mr Speaker. Now, our policies are helping, but we know that the monthly numbers are volatile. We know that there's upward pressure on oil prices because of what's happening in the Middle East, and we know that people are still under pressure. And that's why our cost of living help is so important and so necessary. Our energy bill relief helped ensure that electricity prices fell 17.9 per cent instead of falling 2.7 per cent. Rent assistance took some of the sting out of rents as well, and all of this is making a meaningful and a measurable difference according to the ABS. And we did this while we turned two big Liberal deficits into two big Labor surpluses, surpluses which are also helping in the fight against inflation, according to the Governor of the Reserve Bank. Now, those opposite oppose our cost of living help, and they wouldn't know the first thing about responsible economic management. We are two and a half years into a three-year term, and they still don't have any costed or credible economic policies. They say they want to cut $315 billion in spending, but they won't come clean on what that means for pensions or housing or Medicare, Mr Speaker. They want higher inflation and higher interest rates and a hard landing because they think that will help them politically. They are focused exclusively the on their the petty and divisive and damaging politics, while this side of the House is focused on fighting inflation, on helping with the cost of living, on paying down Liberal debt. Now, we've obviously got more work to do, Mr Speaker, but we are making encouraging and substantial progress on all of these fronts while those opposite just play their usual divisive politics. Yeah. Member for Deakin. 
Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. In 2017, the Treasurer said, and I quote, any housing policy that doesn't have changes to negative gearing and capital gains tax is just a shocker. On what basis has the Treasurer di directed his department to work on a secret new housing tax? Order. Members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Banks will cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr Speaker, for the question from the Shadow Housing Minister, which doesn't want Australia to build any more Order. homes no, for people to live in. The, the, irony... the Treasurer, no, the, the member for Deakin has asked his question within seven seconds. It was not the reason to interject. You'll leave the chamber under 94A. Just show some restraint. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, I've been asked this question a number of times in the course of the last week or two, and I'm happy to answer it again. Uh, I do get advice from time to time on contentious issues from my department, and that shouldn't be seen as unusual. Those opposite did it too, Mr Speaker, when they were looking at jacking Order. up the GST and changing negative gearing when they were in office, Mr Speaker. Now, we've made it really clear that our policy is not to knock off negative Manager gearing or business. the capital gains that's right. discount. And that's because, unlike those opposite, we are focused exclusively right. on building more homes. We are focused on housing supply. And as the Prime Minister has said, and as I have said and others, we are not convinced that ditching those tax breaks would build more homes, and we want to build more homes in our communities. We have a housing policy, and that's not part of it. We have tax policies, and that's not one of them, Mr Speaker. But what is common between our housing policies and our tax policies Order, is that Hume. elements of both of that are in the Senate right now. That's both right. of those are in the Senate right now. And if those opposite were serious about housing or tax reform or budget repair, they would vote for them in the Senate, not oppose them in the Senate. And I think it speaks volumes, Mr Speaker, about this shadow treasurer and this opposition that, faced with a severe shortage of housing, with a debate raging on housing policy, not just in here but around the country, that they would not take any steps to inform themselves of the impact of existing policies. And we know why that is, Mr Speaker, and we know why the shadow housing minister is asking this question, because they don't want to talk about inflation falling. They don't want to talk about the fruits of us stabilising our relationship with China. They don't want to talk about the two surpluses that this Labor government Order. has delivered yep. after the those opposite could deliver none. We'll, we'll pause. The member for one on a point of order. Thanks, Speaker. It goes to relevance. This question wasn't about the opposition. It was on what basis has the Treasurer directed his department to work on a secret new housing tax? The Treasurer was not asked about alternative policies in this question. He was not asked about a compare and contrast. Obviously, he is answering the question about his decisions and perhaps to assist the House if he can frame the remainder of his answer regarding to the question he was asked will greatly assist the opposition and the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The point that I'm making is this. They want to focus on what we're not doing to distract from the progress that we are making yeah, yeah. with the things that we are doing as a Labor government focused on the cost of living and building more homes and cleaning up the mess that they left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Morton. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How is the Albanese Labor government acting to reduce the cost of energy? What other policies would increase the cost of energy. I give a call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thanks uh, very much, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend for the question. I also thank him for his friendship over the last 17 years. I know the whole House wishes him the best, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, the Albanese Order. government Mr. Speaker, is focused on two things, delivering cost of living relief today and delivering cheaper energy into the future. And there have been developments on both fronts since the parliament last sat. Now, Mr Speaker, we are delivering energy bill relief through the budget. 
Member and the Treasurer just referred to the inflation figures that were released the week before last. And those figures released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics also dealt with energy prices and said, and I quote, electricity prices fell 17.9 per cent in the 12 months to August. This is the largest annual fall for electricity on record, Mr yeah. Speaker, says the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And we also have seen progress in relation to energy prices more broadly, and I can tell the House that yesterday wholesale left. electricity prices were $53.92 compared to $286 on the day we came to office, Mr Speaker, and the Shadow Treasurer, the then the Minister for Energy, promised electricity prices at wholesale level of $70 a megawatt hour at the 2019 election, and today they are $53 a megawatt hour, Mr Speaker. So this is what real progress looks like. Now, the honourable member also asked me what could push prices up. And we've also Order. seen developments on that since the House Order. last sat. The a couple of weeks ago, them. Mr Speaker, we saw Member the O'Connor Institute for is Energy, warned. Economics and Financial An Analysis release a report into the prospects of nuclear energy for Australia. Mr. Speaker. And it found that electricity bills would rise by $665 a year for a median electricity bill and more than $1,000 for a family of four. Mr. Speaker. Now, that analysis makes certain sense when you consider that nuclear is the most expensive form of energy available in the world. So, of course, if you introduce it into Australia, we're going to see energy prices go up. But there have been other developments, Mr Speaker. Last night we saw some. We saw about 45 minutes of developments on Four Corners last night, Mr Speaker. Now, it's a bit unusual for a minister to recommend watching a show about an opposition policy, but I do say to the House, if you didn't see Four Corners last night, it's a cracker, Mr Speaker. We had 45 minutes of expert after Order. expert talk about nuclear policy. We saw Peter Bradford, the former Commissioner of, of Nuclear Regulatory the Commission in the Fairfax. United States, a former Commissioner, say what we know about nuclear is that it is very capable of large the disappointments. If Member nuclear was a person, a it would be weeping with its head in the hands of the Vogel story in Georgia, Mr <laughs> Speaker. We saw Stephanie Cook, the former editor of Nuclear Intelligence Weekly, say it amazes me there is so much hype about something that's been such an abject failure, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, it's produced energy, but at what cost? Now, Mr. Speaker, I recommend that show and I recommend the analysis of the opposition's policy because they can't release the details Order. because the details will show the policy is a dog. Call to the honourable member for Hume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister rule out any changes to the tax treatment of the owner-occupied family home and to negative gearing? Order. The Leader of the Opposition, the question has been asked. Order. The Treasurer and the Leader of the Opposition are going to cease interjecting before we have the answer. Order. When everyone ceases interjecting, Prime Minister will have the call. I wait for the anger and arrogance to subside, Mr. Speaker. From, 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 from those opposite. From those opposite. Order. Because as, as the left. Treasurer has just said. As, Order. The, no, and and the there it is the again, Mr. Speaker. There it is again. The Leader of the Opposition, we're not going to be yelling across the chamber. We're just going to take the temperature down. We're going to listen to one another and show each other respect. Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm asked now in this uh, ever-growing list of fishing expeditions, and it should perhaps go to the Minister for uh, Agriculture and Fisheries. This question, I think, Mr. Speaker. So I might ask. I might ask uh, Minister Collins to add to this answer. <laughs> uh, because, Order. Because Prime Minister will I, return to the question. I've actually asked about a new element now, Mr Speaker. Apparently now we're going after the family home. The family home. The family home. We're going after the family home. You know, according to them, according to them, we're going to go in and there'll be a knock on the door. And they'll go, here we are, we're the government. We're here to take your home from you. We're going to nationalise the home. The only political party that I've seen talking about mass nationalisation is those opposite who want to nationalise the energy network and then they want to intervene in the market to nationalise the supermarkets when they're forced to sell. 
the family home. The Prime Minister was in mid-sentence talking about the family home, but I'll take the point of order from the member for Hume. Yep, you're entitled Relevance, to take it one. was a very straightforward question. It wasn't about the opposition. It was about the government's proposal, their secret tax on the family home. Okay. The member for Hume has been entitled to raise his point of order. The Prime Minister has had a preamble. He was mentioning the family home in mid-sentence, so I'm going to just invite him back to the question. Mr Speaker, he's delusional because he speaks about a secret plan. If it's secret, why are they asking about it? <laughs> just seems to me there's a gap there, Mr Speaker. There's a gap. Order. Because the family home is, of, co it is of course... Order. The member for Hume. I can appreciate you've asked the question. Order. We're just going to cease interjecting for the remainder of the answer. Just to assist the House, the Prime Minister can return to the question. Speaker, we have all of our tax policies out there, and all of the ones that they want to talk about are things that we are not doing. We're talking about what we are doing, some of which they are blocking over in the other chamber, including whether it's housing policy or whether it's tax policy. And the idea, I mean, this nonsense that they carry on with, the idea that we're have you got Tourette's or something? <laughs> uh, you know, you know, you just sit there, babble, babble, babble. Order. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. I withdraw. Yeah. I withdraw. I withdraw and apologise, Order. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Order. they sit there, they sit there, and they interject non-stop. The truth is that. We regard, as does every Australian, the, the family home as being is sacrosanct. Warned. Order. When the House comes to order, just reminding the Chamber, the member for O'Connor and the member for McEwen are on warnings. Call to the Honourable Member for Blair. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment and Water. How many renewable energy projects has the Albanese Labor government ticked off? How will these projects ease cost of living pressures for all Australians? How is the government's approach different to other proposals? Call to the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Water. Uh, thanks so much, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Blair for his question. We had a lovely visit to his electorate recently where he took me to meet the people, the good people from Goodness Enterprises and have a look at the koala revegetation project that they're engaged in. Mr Speaker, after a decade of failure, the Liberals and Nationals uh, delay and denial, our government is delivering on a renewable energy boom. So far, I have ticked off on 63 Order, renewable energy Clark. projects. 63 renewable energy projects. And in fact, this year, renewable energy will provide 42 per cent of the energy projecting. in our grid. I'm approving those renewable energy projects at record rates, and those 63 projects are enough to power 7 million Australian homes. That's enough uh, to power New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and the Northern Territory combined. In fact, I'm approving about one renewable energy project every two weeks. Just yesterday, it was the 450 the megawatt page. Goulburn River solar farm in New South Wales, enough power to enough um, power to power 191,000 homes in the member for New England's electorate. On Friday, it was the 350 megawatt, 16 miles solar farm in Queensland, uh, enough to uh, power 160,000 homes in the leader of the Nationals electorate, in fact. And there's plenty more where those come from. I've got another 136 renewable energy projects before me in the pipeline. We are cracking along with the transition to renewable energy in this Member country. We're putting cheaper, cleaner, renewable energy into the grid, into people's homes and into people's businesses right now. But of course, there is a risk to this. The risk is 
those opposite and their expensive, risky plan for nuclear power. Can you imagine what else we could spend the $600 billion on that they're planning to spend on nuclear reactors? Order. The choice is very clear. The choice is very clear at the next election. A slow transition to risky, expensive nuclear reactors under the Liberals or a fast transition to cheaper, cleaner, renewable energy under Labor. A choice between a plan to ease cost of living right now, including with the $300 uh, electricity bill relief, or the most expensive form of electricity perhaps delivered in 20 years' time under those opposite. The last thing our country Order. needs right now Minister's is that sort of insecurity. Give the call to the honourable member for Griffith. To the Prime Minister, the Greens will work with Labor to cap rents, phase out negative gearing and the capital gains discount and invest the savings in a mass build of public housing. We don't expect to get everything. We are ready to negotiate, but you have offered nothing. For the sake of the single mums, one rent increase away from eviction, the families sleeping in their cars, the renters locked out of home ownership by negative gearing and the capital gains discount. Will you work with the Greens to negotiate a plan that helps the millions of people your government is leaving behind? Order. Order. There was far too much noise on my right. The member for Karangamite will leave the chamber under 94A. Do not interject while members are asking questions. It's highly disorderly. Applies to both sides of the chamber. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'll make three points to the member for Griffiths. The first is that we won't be doing measures which aren't part of our policy. And in the case of help to buy, all we're asking for is the Greens political party to vote for something that was their policy. That's the first point that I would make. Secondly, is that some of the proposals uh, that he just went through, the shopping list, including uh, the idea that the Commonwealth is in a position to freeze rents, he knows, I know and everyone in this chamber knows, uh, simply can't be done. It's not within the Commonwealth's power. He knows that's the case and he's being disingenuous uh, when he puts it forward. Thirdly, there's legislation before the parliament at the moment before the Senate. Help to buy. Vote for it. Vote for more homes, and it goes through. There are enough cross-bench votes uh, to ensure it happens. I think that the Liberal Party and the National Party should vote for it as well. It's beyond my comprehension uh, why any political party in this place would intervene to support uh, blocking 40,000 people from home ownership. Call to the Honourable Member for Newcastle. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Women. How is the Albanese Labor government ensuring better economic and social outcomes for Australian women, including by increasing opportunities in traditionally male dominated um, spaces? And how does this compare with other approaches? Call to the Minister representing the Minister for Women. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I, can I thank the member for Newcastle for the question? You couldn't get a prouder advocate for the advancement of women in this country. Thank you. Our government is taking real action to deliver cost of living relief for millions of women, along with significant investments in women's safety. We're investing over a billion dollars to pay superannuation on paid parental leave so women aren't penalised for taking time out to care. We're investing over $3 billion to reduce student debt and fix the indexation of help loans with women holding the majority of these loans. Our tax cuts, which came into effect on 1 July this year, have delivered Australian women taxpayers an average a tax cut of $1,649. This all comes on top of our work to close the gender pay gap and support fair wages for those in our critical care industries like aged care and, of course, early childhood education. Delivering for women is in the DNA of the Labor Party. We're the first government in Australia's history where women make up more than 50 per cent of our party room, reflective of Australian society. We know having women around the table matters, whether it is in the boardrooms of this country or whether it is in the Cabinet room. And across the country, there are very, very few places, I'm glad to say, where women are not involved and are not allowed. 
But one such place, as those of us in Victoria would know, is a place called the Athenaeum Club. It's at the top end of Collins Street, stands as a bastion to a long, long gone age. It's a place that neither I nor any single woman in this country could become a member. A club that describes itself as a place for gentlemen of good character. <laughs> or in other words, a place that prohibits the membership of women. People like Graham Samuel, people like Terry Moran, and even the former Liberal Party State Director John Ridley have walked away from this club over this issue, with Ridley describing the situation of not allowing women members as pathetic. Yet just last week, who decided to not only attend this club, but to actually hold a fundraiser in this club, none other than the Leader of the Opposition. What a lack of character does this show, the Leader of the Opposition holding a fundraiser at this club that prohibits women's membership. Order. On this side, we want women around the Cabinet table. We want women around the board table. We don't want women excluded anywhere. We want to make sure that women are involved because when Minister they are, it matters. Services. On this, this side of the House, that's what we want. On that side of the House, they don't even want them involved at all. Yeah. Call to the Honourable the Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment. It's now more than a month since Regis Resources confirmed the Blaney Gold Mine, a $1 billion investment with some 800 regional jobs, was no longer viable due to the Minister's Section 10 decision. Last month, the Minister promised in question time, and I quote, I've made it clear to the company that they'll get a statement of reasons. Has the Minister provided a statement of reasons to Regents? If not, is the government hiding? I call to the Minister for the Environment and Minister for Water. Uh, thank you for the question and um, thank you for uh, raising this important issue again. Um, I'm very confident that I made the right decision. I've just uh, finalised um, looking at the statement of re uh, reasons. The, it should be with the company very shortly, uh, this week certainly. Um, but I'm well, it's interesting that the Deputy Leader of um, the Liberals should be interjecting. I made the decision based on advice from the same group that she Order. made a decision based on in Bathurst, the same group of people, the same, for the same reasons, under the sec oh, same No, the Minister path. for the Environment, the member for Solomon is warned. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition I can appreciate may have strong views on this, but just a continual conversation while the minister is answering a question is highly disorderly. For the remainder of this answer, to assist the House, to assist me to listen to the minister, I'm just going to ask, invite the deputy leader not to interject anymore. I made a decision that a mining company can't build a tailings dam on the headwaters and springs of the Bulabula River because it is culturally significant to First Nations people in the area. I'd remind uh, the Leader of the Nationals that I haven't blocked the mine, I've blocked the building of the tailings dam. The company themselves have said that they have investigated alternative Order. sites for that tailings dam. I have protected 16 per cent of the 2,500 hectares of the site that the company owns. I'd also note that both the chair and the CEO have bought extra shares in the company since I made my decision, and that the share value of the company substantially increased after I made my decision. So, um, the, the, only, the only thing I would leave those opposite with is um, they've said that they would approve this project without ever yep says the leader of the nationals he's never looked at the information from the traditional the, owners the he hasn't the read a page of the two and a half thousand pages of documents i've examined he hasn't received any information from any expert that's how we got that's Order. how we got robo debt that's how we got that's how we got sports rorts. That's how we got car park rorts. It's picking friends Order. and picking winners without any evidence, without any examination of the facts.
give a call to the honourable member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. How is the Albanese Labor government helping to ease cost of living pressures in early childhood education and care for workers and families? I call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education and the Minister for Youth. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I do thank the member for Robertson, not just for his question, but for his continued dedication and commitment to early childhood education and care. Now, the member for Robertson will know that this week in his electorate of Robertson and indeed right across Australia, families will be sitting around the kitchen table working out their household budgets. And for many of them, a significant factor in working out those budgets is the cost of early childhood education and care. For them, it will determine how much they can work or even in some cases if they can go back to work. It will determine how much money is left over for discretionary spending, for putting food on the table even. Uh, early childhood education is indeed a significant factor in cost of living for families with young children. And that's why we introduced our Cheaper Childcare Bill as one of the first acts that we did when we came into office. Now, the latest data we have shows that these reforms have reduced out-of-pocket expenses on average by 13 per cent. 13 per cent from, July, from, some, sorry, from June 2023 to June 2024. What that means is for a family on $120,000, they have saved $2,140 in early childhood education and care costs than they otherwise would have paid. Uh, and in July, that same family also got a tax cut of $2,679. Now, making early childhood education and care more affordable is not just about the cost of living relief. It's actually a first step towards our vision of universal early childhood education and care. And to do that, we know we need a sustainable workforce. And that's why we introduced an historic 15 per cent wage rise. And I'm pleased to say that from today, providers can now apply. They can now apply for the government funding to deliver this wage increase. This means that 200,000 early childhood education and care workers will have at least $100 more in their pay packets uh, by this time, uh, by Christmas, before Christmas. Uh, along with their tax cuts, that means that early childhood education and care workers can earn more and keep more of what they earn. It means that we retain more workers and we build a strong and stable workforce. It means keeping costs down for families by capping the amount that, they can, that providers can increase their fees by 4.4 per cent. Mr Speaker, this is how you deliver cost of living relief. Tax cuts, wage growth, working towards an early childhood education system that's affordable, accessible and inclusive for every child, for every family, for every community. Yeah. I give a call to the honourable member for McKellar. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister for the Environment and Water. This week, Australia is hosting the world's first ever Global Nature Positive Summit, focusing on private investment in nature repair. Meanwhile, research from the Biodiversity Council shows the government continues to spend $26 billion every year on harming biodiversity. How can we hope to be nature positive in this country when the government continues to invest in being nature negative? And shouldn't we first stop subsidising nature negative activity activities like native forest logging? Thank you. I call to the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Water. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for McKellar for her question. She is a diligent, thoughtful advocate for the environment, and I know her constituents thank her for that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the first ever Global Nature Positive Summit in Sydney has attracted a thousand delegates from around the world, around Australia and around the world, from over 50 countries. And I can tell you there is enormous enthusiasm at this meeting for a nature positive future. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to share the fantastic things that Australia is doing and to learn from best practice around the world. Yesterday, for example, uh, a, a range of Australian businesses and NGOs launched Nature Positive Matters, a really important initiative to change some of the economic settings that the member for McKellar 
is referring to. And we also saw yesterday uh, that the number of Australian companies that are uh, reporting on their nature impacts using the TNFD framework has in fact doubled in the lead up to the summit, another important achievement. Today, we announced that the Albanese government uh, is now the global leader in ocean protection. We protect more of our marine environment than any other country on earth. We've added the Heard Island and Macdonald Island expansion of the marine parks to the areas that we protect. So, Today we announced an additional 310,000 square kilometres will be protected by the Albanese Labor government. That's an area the size of Italy. It is the largest addition to conservation anywhere in the world this year, and it comes on top of last year's expansion of the Macquarie Island Marine Park, which was the largest uh, addition to conservation anywhere on the globe last year. Two years running, we have been global leaders in conservation. I think that's something to be pretty proud of. And I can tell you that the delegates at this conference are uh, so impressed by the fact that we've already passed our first tranche of environmental laws with a stronger water trigger, that we are uh, hoping to set up Australia's first environment protection agency, if we can manage to get the Greens and the crossbench or the Liberals and the Nationals to vote for it in the Senate. We were just one vote away from it. We've doubled funding for our national parks. We've uh, kept the Great Barrier Reef off the endanger listing. Uh, we've um, started the work to get Murrajuga and Cape York onto the World Heritage List and so much more, uh, Mr Speaker. Australia has a right to be very proud. Yeah. The call to the Chief Government Whip. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care. How is the Albanese Labor government helping aged care workers earn more and keep more of what they earn? And what impact is that having on the quality of aged care in Australia? Yeah. The call to the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister for Sport. I thank the member for Lawler for her question and for her devoted commitment to looking after older Australians in her electorate. Uh, Mr Speaker, the cornerstone of the Albanese government's mission to lift the standard of aged care in Australia has been to recognise the value of all aged care workers. Yeah. In 2023, we invested $11.3 billion to deliver a historic increase to the award wage for 250,000 workers. But our investment in aged care workers didn't end there. Last month, we delivered a further $3.8 billion to fund stage three of the Fair Work decision, a decision which importantly included workers who were excluded from stage two, food service assistants, admin staff, cleaners and workers engaged in non-direct care. Those workers can expect to see an increase in their pay packets from 1 January 2025. These pay rises are having a real impact on workers. I recently met with residents and workers at Mercy Place in Cairns in the member for Leichhardt's electorate. I spoke with a registered nurse named Kavitha who looks after clinical services there. It was only Kavitha's fourth week working in aged care. Before that, she had been working in acute nursing in hospital. She told me that she'd been wanting to work in aged care for years because she was particularly passionate about caring for older people. But she wanted a career that allowed her to build stronger relationships with the people that she cared for, rather than the more transient hospital system. Mm. But to be blunt, she told me that for a long time she couldn't afford to work in aged care, even though that was her preference. But that was until the Albanese government delivered a 15 per cent increase to the award wage for aged care workers. Mm -hmm. And now a registered nurse like Kavitha can earn up to $10,000 a year more than she could have than she could have under those opposite. Yeah. And on top of that, Excellent. they're getting a tax cut. So they're not just yeah. earning more, they are keeping more of oh, what well, they is. earn. <laughs> that bigger pay packet allowed Kavitha finally to cross over to aged care and pursue her dream career. Yeah. And Kavitha told me that aged care is no longer a last choice. It is a career of choice. She said our aged care improvements had made the pursuit of a career in aged care more dynamic and more rewarding. Kavitha is not alone. 
Data from SEEK tells us that there has been a doubling in applications for jobs for aged care and disability carers since these wage increases began. Double. Mr Speaker, that is what happens when you value aged care workers. Just before I call the Manager of Opposition Business, I'm pleased to inform the House that President in the Gallery today is Her Excellency Mrs Esther Monteberebio Villa, the Ambassador of Spain to Australia, alongside a high-level delegation from the Spain Australia Council Foundation. A warm welcome to you all. I give the call to the Manager of Opposition Business. My question is to the Prime Minister. Next week marks the one-year anniversary of the failed voice referendum, where over 60 per cent of Australians rejected the Prime Minister's $450 million effort to divide our country during a cost-of-living crisis. Is the Prime Minister still committed to Makarata? I give a call to the Prime Minister. I, I thank the member for his question. Of course, he would remember the voice referendum because he held two forums in his electorate, Mr Speaker. He held a forum for yes people and a forum for no people. Did both, did both uh, during that, that referendum. And I note, Order. And Order. I note that Members on my left. I note that it wasn't yes and no together an engagement. It was two separate uh, voices, two separate messages to two separate constituencies, because because he's um, he, he's worried about what's going on uh, up, up there in, in in that corner, and and, 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 he, and he should be, and he should be, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'll take the interjection from the leader of the opposition. Uh, where he speaks about straight answers. Uh, he promised during the referendum campaign to have another referendum. That is what he promised to do. He said, if you vote no, you will get another referendum and an opportunity to vote for recognition in Australia's constitution. Now, the question for him and the question for the member for Bradfield is, is that still their position? Give the call. Order. Give the call to the honourable member for McEwen. My question is to the Minister for Health. How is the Albanese Labor government ensuring Australians have access to affordable, life-changing medicines on the PBS? Why is the government making all medicines on the PBS cheaper after a decade of cuts and neglect? Give the call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for McEwen for his question and his support of strengthening Medicare and making medicines cheaper. He knows that Australia has one of the best medicine systems in the world, Mr. Speaker, one underpinned by the PBS, one of Labor legacies that again was opposed tooth and nail by the Liberal Party at the time. And the PBS ensures that Australians have access to the world's best treatment at affordable prices. And since we were elected only two and a bit years ago, Mr Speaker, we've made more than 250 new and expanded listings on the PBS. This month, among with a number of other medicines, we listed a new medicine, Vazkepa, to reduce the risk of repeat heart attacks or strokes for patients with high triglycerides. Around one in three people, Mr Speaker, who survive a heart attack or a stroke will go on to have a repeat event within seven years, and so often that repeat event will either be deadly or, at the very least, very seriously disabling. And this is the first treatment listed on the PBS for this group of patients. It will benefit more than 10,000 patients a year, Mr Speaker. We think it will save lives. It will genuinely save many, many lives, and it will be available at PBS prices, those affordable PBS prices, instead of patients paying almost $2,000 a year. And Mr Speaker, we've been making those PBS prices even cheaper for all Australians. In our first three months, we slashed the maximum amount that pensioners would pay for medicines across a given year by 25 per cent. And the final budget outcome that the Treasurer released last month Mr. Speaker, revealed that that measure alone delivered pensioners 
22 million free scripts last year that would otherwise not have been delivered. 22 million free scripts, saving pensioners about $170 million just in one, well, just in one year. And last year, Mr. Speaker, also we delivered general patients, not concessional patients, but general patients, the biggest cut to the price of medicines in the 75-year history of the PBS. These measures, along with 60-day scripts and all those additional listings on the PBS, have saved Australians hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, making a real difference to Australian households. But we know household budgets are still under real pressure, Mr Speaker, and that we have to do more, which is why in this year's budget we also announced that we would be freezing the price of PBS medicines next year for up to five years, saving patients another $500 million. Mr. Speaker. But what we also know is that is all under threat under threat from a shadow treasurer who has said very openly he doesn't support any of our additional investments in bulk billing, in urgent care clinics and in cheaper medicines. Mr. Speaker. That is the clear choice for Australians – cheaper medicines, cost of living or those opposite. Call the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I ask further questions. Place on the notice paper.